You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org, Medscape Cardiology. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape. You can now access the latest in medical news on your Amazon Alexa-enabled device. Join me, Perry Wilson, every weekday morning for Medscape Medical Minute, where I highlight the top medical stories of the day. To add Medscape Medical Minute to your flash briefing, search for Medscape Medical Minute on Amazon and click Enable. Or open the Amazon Alexa app, go to Skills, search for Medscape Medical Minute, and click Enable. Then say, Alexa, what's the news? Or, Alexa, what's my flash briefing? I hope you'll join us. Hi, everyone. This is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology, and this is This Week in Cardiology for October 27th, 2023. This week, I want to do an addendum on the Million Heart Study, some feedback on the Enrich AF Study, Tavi versus Saver, the Partner 3 and Evolute Low Risk Trials have reported, and is measuring myocardial viability dead? I first want to do a brief addendum on my report last week on the Million Hearts Model Randomized Controlled Trial. Now, the idea of the Million Hearts Model is a good one. It is to pay healthcare organizations to assess and reduce cardiovascular risk. At least initially, this was focused on the highest risk patients. This was an RCT published in JAMA in which organizations were randomized to the Million Hearts Model of incentives to measure and lower cardiac risk versus standard of care. The primary endpoint was a good one, a MACE endpoint, and these were primary prevention patients. I need to clarify some of my coverage last week. After This Week in Cardiology aired, I did have a long conversation about this study with my friend and colleague, Andrew Foy from Penn State, and he taught me some important nuances about this very complicated study that I wanted to communicate with you all. Last week, I said that the program did not pay for achieving anything. They only paid to measure risk, and I liked that idea. But that wasn't quite right. Million Hearts did pay to measure risk using risk calculators, which I feel are underused, at least in my zip code. But they also paid for reducing risk, at least for part of the study. Quote, CMS made performance-based risk reduction payments. CMS paid each organization $0, $5, or $10 for each high-risk beneficiary with an annual risk reassessment with monthly payments that depended on the mean risk score change across all of the organization's high-risk beneficiaries. That's an important methodological point, right? Because this now creates an incentive, a nudge, if you will, for clinicians to convince patients to take a statin or take more medicines for high blood pressure. Now, I say it nudged for more medications because in these risk equations, the only modifiable risks are blood pressure and cholesterol, at least for non-smokers, hence more pills. Now, the thing about primary prevention is it ought to be largely concordant with a patient's goals. If there are rewards for getting patients to have lower LDLs and lower blood pressure, then the doctor is going to be motivated to treat more aggressively, which is fine if the patients want that, but some patients don't care so much about that little bit of extra risk lowering. Maybe it's not worth it for them. Andrew Foy also made two other important points about the uh, results. Yes, the first result, there was a relative risk reduction in organizations that had been randomized to the intervention group. Specifically, it was a 3.3% lower rate of cardiovascular events uh, in the intervention arm versus the control arm. The adjusted hazard ratio, and I'm not kidding about this, was 0.97, so 3% relative. But Foy also taught me to study table three of the results more closely, and two teaching points arise from doing that. One is that the benefits stem from medium risk patients, not so much high risk patients. Recall that Million Hearts was initially going to measure effects only in high-risk patients, but there weren't going to be enough events, so they expanded the study to include medium-risk primary prevention patients. Now, I used to think the idea that medium-risk patients were more likely to benefit was counterintuitive, but Foy's research has shown that oftentimes the higher-risk patients benefit less from cardiovascular therapies. 
And that's probably because of competing risks of other things and or increased risk of harms from the treatment. And I think that is such an important point. The other important point from the Million Heart Study was also in Table 3, and this had to do with healthcare use utilization, specifically all-cause hospitalization, which was higher in the Million Hearts group versus the standard care. The p-value of that comparison was actually the lowest of any study at 0.005, and again, the higher rate of all-cause hospitalizations were driven mostly by high-risk patients, though both medium-risk and high-risk patients had higher all-cause hospitalizations. Why is that important? Well, because all-cause hospitalization is a pretty unbiased endpoint measurement of overall health, right? You're either admitted to the hospital or you're not. So this tells that me that the extra treatment in the Million Hearts model may have led to a very small reduction in cardiovascular events, but at the cost of more total hospitalizations. So Foy really feels like this study is a wash for the Million Hearts intervention. Now, one final caveat, the intervention group did have a 4% lower all-cause death rate, but I think that is likely statistical noise because A, there are a small number of events, and B, when you go to the supplement, there are large components of non-cardiovascular death that are lower in the intervention group. Bottom line, this was a very complicated study. It doesn't convince me that nudges at the organization level have any great impact, especially when we are using them on higher risk patients. All right, second bit of feedback is the Enrich AF study. Now, it's crazy. I'm getting a lot of notes from really big investigators. At 0300 Friday AM, a few hours before I taped this podcast, I heard from the Enrich AF investigators. Recall that last week I covered a meta-analysis of four trials that looked at restarting oral anticoagulation after an intracranial hemorrhage. And I know that sounds crazy. That's why I covered it. I was struck by the quite positive results in the primary thrombosis outcome. It was 32% lower in the group of patients who had hemorrhage who were restarted on oral anticoagulants. Overall, major bleeding was not significantly increased in that group. Also, not different was the endpoint death or dependence. It made me think that this blanket idea, like you had an intracranial hemorrhage and you can never take oral anticoagulants again, that's a foolish idea. Now, also relevant to the discussion I had last week was a trial called Enrich AF, which was not included in the meta-analysis because it is still ongoing. The authors of this study of edoxaban versus no edoxaban in patients with AF and a intracranial hemorrhage history they wrote a letter in the Lancet Neurology Journal, and they announced that an early review of the data found that patients who had specific kinds of intracranial hemorrhage, that is, low bar intracerebral bleeding and convexity subarachnoid hemorrhage bleeding, will stop receiving edoxaban in the trial because of excess bleeding. Now, I had said that the trial was terminating, but that's not true. The authors clarified that Enrich AF will continue to enroll and in fact, patients with qualifying intracranial hemorrhage other than other than low bar intracerebral hemorrhage and convexity subarachnoid hemorrhage will continue to be enrolled in this trial. And based on their current predictions, they wrote to me that the study results will be available in the first half of 2025. And, and Enrich AF is important because it's the largest trial of oral anticoagulation in patients with AF who have survived an intracranial hemorrhage. There'll be at least 750 patients enrolled. That is even more than the meta-analysis that I mentioned last week. So thanks for that feedback. All right, next topic is TAVI versus SAVR. That is transcatheter aortic valve implantation versus surgical aortic valve replacement. The annual TCT meeting provided a lot of new data on this issue of the TAVI versus SAVR this time in low surgical risk patients who had severe aortic stenosis. I'm going to cover two big trials, PARTNER 3 five-year results that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine and the EVOLUTE low risk trial, a four-year results which was published as a research letter in Jack. First, PARTNER 3. This was uh, TAVI with the balloon expandable valve versus 
surgical AVR in low risk patients. The primary endpoint, which was different than all other primary endpoints in these trials, was stroke, death, and and rehospitalization at one year. The trialists did both non-inferiority testing and superiority testing at the time of the first report. The trial enrolled about 1,000 patients, mean age 73 years. The original one-year results strongly favored TAVI 8.5 versus 15.1% for the primary outcome results. This was largely driven by the rehospitalization rate, which of course favors TAVI because surgical patients are expected to have a more difficult short-term course after the procedure. At five years, five years, these results are different. The primary endpoint remained. There was also secondary primary endpoints, which was now a hierarchical composite that included death, disabling stroke, non-disabling stroke, number of rehospitalization days, and this was analyzed by the win ratio, which counts uh, death as a, a bigger outcome than disabling stroke and, and likewise. Now, I'm not sure why exactly, but the authors analyzed the primary endpoints, this time with superiority testing. Was TAVI superior was now the question, whereas in the original trial, it was non-inferiority. Okay, now the results, the primary endpoint. Rather than the 8.5 versus 15.1 for TAVI versus SAVR in the one-year results, it was now 22.8% versus 27.2% TAVI versus SAVR. That 6.6% absolute risk reduction in the first year had now been reduced to 4.4% after five years. This difference no longer met statistical significance for superiority. The non-significance also held true for the second primary endpoint, that hierarchical win ratio, and that was 1.17, and the conference intervals went from 0.9 to 1.5. The p-value was pretty high at 0.25. So the components of the primary endpoint uh, require some comment. Death was now higher in the TAVI arm, higher, 10% versus 8.2%. Stroke was a bit lower, but really no difference, 5.8 versus 6.4. The hemodynamic performance and the rate of bioprosthetic valve performance were fairly similar, although this was concerning clinically significant valve thrombosis, according to VARC-3 criteria. That occurred in 2.5% of the TAVI arm versus one patient in the surgery arm. A note on the death analysis, there was clear crossing of these Kaplan-Meier curves. So while TAVI clearly had an early advantage, you see at one year the Kaplan-Meier curves uh, cross, and then they separate uh, with the benefit going to the surgical group. When you look at what's called a landmark analysis starting at one year, there is a 61% higher death rate with TAVI versus surgery. It's not quite statistically significant, but the curves are remarkable because they separate and they're increasingly separated over time. The author's conclusion in the New England Journal of Medicine read, quote, among low-risk patients with severe symptomatic AS who underwent TAVI or surgery, there was no significant between-group differences in the two primary composite outcomes. So my comments, first, the good, then the uncertain, then the critical. So the good, TAVI trialists have done a nice job studying this new technique. I wish all aspects of cardiology had this degree of evidence to analyze. TAVI trialists have also stimulated more research on surgical valves, which was sorely lacking before these trials. Another good point, TAVI looks quite decent at five years, right? Mean age of patients in their mid-70s, not having your chest open and getting these results is going to be somewhat compelling to patients facing this decision. Uncertain, but these are bioprosthetic valves. Five years is good data, but you really start seeing things with bioprosthetic valves at eight to 10 years. The higher rate of valve thrombosis in the TAVI arm is worrisome, as are the separating death curves. We need to see more data. Another uncertainty, one piece of data that is there but not published is the type of surgical valve used. Some are better than others. I wonder if some of the bad outcomes in the SAVR arm are clustered in surgical valves that are no longer used or felt to be inferior. It would be nice to see that data. If the data were open, we'd be able to look at that. 
I'll also discuss that in the Evolute Low Risk Trial. Now, here's a critical point. The conclusions as written in the New England Journal of Medicine are wrong. I know, wrong. You don't say there were no significant differences in a superiority trial. You say TAVI failed to meet superiority over surgery at five years. Saying it in the first way may be true, but it is not true to the science. Saying it in the first way also spins the results to favor TAVI. Another critical point, the choice to add rehospitalizations in the primary endpoint of partner three is kind of unbecoming. It's unbecoming because it obviously biases against surgery and everyone knows it. All the other trials measured stroke and death. It tempts people, neutral people like me, to think cynically. Another critical point, the death curves are separating. Yes, while many patients may not care about a 2% absolute higher death rate with savvy at five years, many might care. There are plausible reasons why this could be true too, right? You could have more valve thrombosis, more pacemakers, etc. In a perfect world, patients would be shown these landmark analyses as part of the informed consent. I hope that happens, but I'm not sure it always happens. All right, next topic, Evolute Low Risk. This trial was similar in some ways to Partner 3, TAVI versus surgery. TAVI was a self-expanding valve, 1,400 patients mean age, 74 years. These were low surgical risk patients, and the primary endpoint was far better looking at disabling stroke and death. The original trial was published in 2019 in New England. It was two-year results, though many patients at that time had not reached two years. So in that paper, there was a lot of imputing of data. Bottom line, at that time, for the primary, it was 5.3% a TAVI arm, 67 in the surgery group, and the posterior probability of non-inferiority was like greater than 0.99. It was a Bayesian analysis, but yes, almost certain non-inferiority. Now, the Evolute low-risk authors have published yearly results at TCT. We got four-year results in the form of a research letter in Jack. The main results for the primary endpoint at four years was 10.7% with TAVI, 14% of surgery, it's a hazard ratio of 0.74, 26% reduction. Confidence intervals were tantalizing, right? 0.54 to 1.00, and the p-value is exactly 0.05. The Kaplan-Meier curves, though, are kind of different than Partner 3. In Evolute Low Risk, the differences seem to be getting better, better over time with TAVI. The absolute risk reduction with TAVI at four years versus surgery was 3.4%, but it was only 1.8% at one, one year. The rates of the primary uh, endpoint components, death 9% versus 12.1%. That p-value is 0.07. Stroke 2.9 versus 3.8. That p-value is 0.3. New permanent pacemaker implantation was significantly higher in a TAVI arm 25% versus 10%. Clinical or subclinical valve thrombosis, not different. Aortic valve performance looked a bit better in the TAVI arm. The mean gradients were less, but surgical valves had less aortic insufficiency. The author's conclusion, TAVI patients in the Evolute Lowers trial continue to show excellent outcomes for the primary endpoint and significantly better hemodynamics than SAVR patients through four years. The difference in all-cause mortality or disabling stroke seen early in the Evolute Low Risk Trial continues to diverge in favor of TAVI with a 26% reduction in hazard for death or disabling stroke through four years. My comments. The authors note a very large and differential amount of loss to follow-up in the surgical arm. This is similar to other trials, but it's nearly double uh, loss to follow-up in Evolute uh, in the surgery group versus the TAVI group. That totals 11% of all surgical patients. To me, this adds quite a bit of uncertainty because the primary outcome had a p-value of 0.05, and it would not take many events to push that either way. I also wonder, what is different about Evolute low risk? I say that because surgeon Victor Diane noted that the four-year death rate in the surgical arm of Evolute is 12%, but it's only 5.6% in partner three. That's curious, and to me, it suggests something different about patient selection in these two trials. Yet, 
I have to say, the neutral view of Evolute Low Risk is that it looks quite promising. I agree with the authors that we need more data. I don't know why the TAVI death and stroke curves are looking better over time for Evolute, and they're actually looking worse for Partner 3. If you know why, let me know. I don't think it's statistical noise. The higher PACER rate in Evolute really worries me. PACER complications are going to increase over time. So let's see 5, 8, and 10-year data, which we will see. Another area of uncertainty that I mentioned before is the idea about the surgical valves. I went back and I looked at the three-year results of Evolute, which was published early in 2023 in Jack. Three of the reinterventions in the Saver arm were for a trifecta valve, which some surgeons tell me is considered inferior and not even used. So it makes me wonder about an analysis of the events by surgical valve in the surgery arm. Now, I realize that both groups have valves that iterate, so I'm not saying we should make too much of this, but it is curious to me that the trial compares one type of valve, a self-expanding TAVI, to a hodgepodge of surgical valves. The other thing I wonder about, should we now have a head-to-head trial comparing self-expanders versus balloon expanders in patients who have suitable anatomy for both? All right, next topic is myocardial viability. If myocardial viability as a medical test is not dead, it is surely actively dying and in need of hospice care. One of my favorite trials, the revived BCIS trial, has reported a pre-specified secondary analysis that is worth discussing. Revived is an awesome trial. It shredded the common dogma that patients with heart failure should have coronary angiography to find coronary disease so that coronary disease can be fixed and outcomes improved. Revive took patients with a low EF, ischemic cardiomyopathy, extensive multivessel coronary disease that was amenable to PCI and myocardial viability, and they randomized to either PCI or tablets. I want you to pause there and imagine, imagine the angiograms, all those perfectly PCI-able lesions and uh, half the group was randomized to leave them alone and tablets alone. At the end of 3.5 years, there was not a shred of difference in the primary outcome of death or heart failure hospitalizations. I believe you should put this study in your phone, save it, study. It's one of the most important trials of our time, and I think it's pretty much unassailable. I have yet to see a good critique of this trial. Well, JAMA Cardiology has published a sub-study uh, looking to determine the effect of the extent of viable and non-viable myocardium on the effectiveness of PCI on prognosis and the improvement of LV function after PCI. Again, this is the idea is that we can find a subset of patients within Revive that actually got better. Now, recall that you had to have evidence of viability in at least four myocardial segments that were dysfunctional at rest to be randomized in the trial. Viability in Revive was determined by CMR or WME stress echo or nuclear imaging, but for this substudy, they used only CMR and WME stress echo because the numbers in the nuclear arm were so small, and these studies were read in blinded fashion. The authors of the substudy then separated the degree of viability into tertiles, low viability, medium viability, and lots of viability. The primary outcome of this subgroup analysis was death and heart failure hospitalization. They also looked at secondary outcomes like CV death, heart failure hospitalizations, and improved LV function at six months. The mean age of the patient, 69 years. Of the 700 patients in the main revived trial, this analysis included 610, so all but 90 patients. In the main analysis, a primary outcome event occurred in 36% of the two groups, PCI medicines, absolutely no difference. That's, that's the main trial results. But the main finding of this sub-study was, and I put this in bolded text in the transcript, there was no interaction between the extent of viable myocardium and the effect of assignment to PCI or medical therapy on occurrence of the primary outcome or any other secondary outcome. Boom. Read that again. Figure 2 in the paper plotted the primary outcome events based on how much viability there was. The curves were superimposable with PCI or medical therapy, no matter the amount of viability. Also, the amount of viable myocardium or the extent of non-viable myocardium 
did not affect the rate of the primary outcome or CV death. Now, the one predictor they did see is that the greater amounts of SCAR predicted the occurrence of a primary outcome and a secondary outcome event. But that's not a surprise, right? SCAR predicts bad things. But again, there was no interaction with treatment effect. So this was irrespective of treatment assignment. None of the viability characteristics interacted with the effect of assignment to PCI or medicines on the likelihood of improvement of LV function either. And CMR did not do any better than dobiamine stress echo. A sensitivity analysis based on LGE threshold less than or equal to 50% also showed no association between the extent of viability and the primary outcome, as well as no interaction with the treatment assignment. And for this 479 participants assessed with CMR imaging, scar burden did not interact with the effect of assignment to PCI versus OMT on the risk of the primary outcome or any other secondary outcome. The authors concluded this study found that viability testing does not identify patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy who benefit from PCI. My comments. Now, the idea of viability made so much sense. I mean, a heart muscle can be healthy, it can be hibernating and not working well because of ischemia, or it can be scarred, non-contractile, and basically dead. For years, we thought, let's find that second category. Let's then revascularize the areas with muscle that's still alive but poorly functioning because of ischemia. It is why so many patients with heart failure get referred for angiography. And we see this clinically, right? We see these patients back in their ejection fractions better, but we're fooled because these patients are also treated with medical therapy and things like CRT. The first clue that myocardial viability may be a figment of wishful thinking came from an analysis of STITCH. STITCH is an RCT of cabbage versus medicines in patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy and multivessel CAD. The main results of STITCH are really surprising. In 2000, 2011, like revived, cabbage was no better than tablets for reducing a primary outcome of death. But a sub-study of STITCH looking at viability was quite revealing. Turns out that about half the patients in STITCH had viability scans. Of these, half were randomized to cabbage and half to medicines. And after they adjusted for other variables, the extent of viability had no association with mortality. Now, the criticism of that STITCH study was that it only included half the patients. But now we have an analysis of a more modern trial revived in which nearly 90% had viability testing and it had no, zero modification of treatment. Yes, SCAR predicted worse outcomes, but we already knew that. I think this study, this sub-study of revived, taken together with the previous stitch, strongly suggests that we save our money on viability tests. The preponderance of the data say that revascularization does not improve outcomes in patients who have ischemic cardiomyopathy. Bottom line, we should treat these patients medically. We should reserve revascularization for symptomatic angina. And we shouldn't be tempted to try and find that perfect patient who will improve revascularization, certainly not with viability testing. Next week, next week, this is a final note. I'm going to have much more from TCT. I mean, I've already gone on for almost 30 minutes. Uh, I'll do more next week. I'll have more to say about the Triluminate trial, Watchman Taver trial, and a super sobering comparison study of Watchman versus Amulet. Stay tuned next week for more studies from TCT. So that's it for this week in cardiology. As always, I'm grateful that you listened. Thank you. And remember, if you like this podcast, Please take the time to give us a rating. Write us a one or two sentence review. These things really help others find us. I appreciate the feedback. Keep it coming. Until next week, this is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology. You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape.